लेक्चर सीरीज के साथ हम लोग सभी जुड़े हैं सो आई हैव रिक्वेस्टेड माय स्पीकर ऑनरेबल स्पीकर दैट ही विल बी जॉइनिंग एट अराउंड 1:55 एंड एट शार्प 2:00 वी शैल स्टार्ट द प्रोग्राम द स्टूडेंट्स must be knowing that uh, the time schedule between uh, india and germany is the time difference of around 3 and a half hours so agar hamare yahan ye 2 baje ka to christoph and the man apni journey se wo 10:30 mein unka wo samay hoga ye time pattern hi ek cheez aisi hai jo vidyarthiyon ko janna chahiye how from the greenwich mean time the time is denoted and the global time frame mein hum kahan pe rehte hain so mr bhavuk sharma ji he is coordinating this event shekhar ji he has also joined and uh, umar have you joined the technical person umar he will be joining from the departmental no patna university central library he will be controlling the live streaming through youtube so i have requested uh, on uh, your whatsapp group semester 1 and 3 that uh, today is a important day for us so i am expecting all of you to join this program so first or second uh, third semester ke jo vidyarthi hain unse ye bhi मेरा निवेदन होगा कि आप अपने दूसरे साथियों को भी ये रिक्वेस्ट करें उनसे बोले कि आज इस कंक्लूडिंग लेक्चर सीरीज में वो सभी उपस्थित हों अभी तक करीब 17 पार्टिसिपेंट्स मुझे नजर आ रहे हैं और अधिक से अधिक कम से कम 50 की संख्या हम लोगों की होनी चाहिए आई हैव शेयर्ड द लिंक विद द जियोलॉजिकल सर्वे ऑफ इंडिया विद द सेंट्रल ग्राउंड वाटर बोर्ड एंड ऑल्सो अमॉन्स द alumni group of the department of geology and uh, in the patna science college teachers group also so we can expect a large participation from the faculty members and also the students of msc and also the group has been shared with the bsc students also so let us see that uh, how many of you are able to join this important event this is a historic moment for the department of geology the concluding lecture of uh, dr christoph anderman under the platinum jubilee lecture series so we are very fortunate that uh, Dr Christoph has taken time from his busy schedule and he will be with us for his presentation Ah uh, nice to see you Umar Umar you have joined I am very happy Umar can you hear me meri awaaz aapko mil rahi hai Yes sir Okay very good very good so you are coordinating and you will be live streaming the event through your system from the central library patna university isn't it ha uh, umar aapka camera ko aap to ha yes good shekhar ji aap ek bar apna audio check kar lijiye Shekhar can you hear me Oh nice to see uh I've just seen that uh, Oh welcome uh, Dr Christoph nice to nice to see you I was just 
just uh, informing the uh, students of our department that uh, the time difference between uh, here at Patna and at Berlin, Potsdam, it's uh, around three and a half hours. So there at uh, Berlin, it must be around uh, three or uh, ten thirty morning. So <laughs> good morning on behalf of the participants and the students, faculty members here, and we are very happy to invite you to this uh, Platinum Jubilee lecture series. As uh, informed you earlier that uh, we, we shall wait for uh, a couple of minutes and then uh, sharp at uh, 2 p.m. IST, uh, we shall uh, start. Otherwise, uh, uh, just to inform you that uh, here now, uh, after a long time, we are getting rain and uh, the rain collector on the rooftop of our department the staff is collecting and we are uh, maintaining the schedule. But this year, as expected, uh, the other parts of uh, the state is uh, having good uh, shower. But uh, yeah. here in the capital city of Patna, in the state of Bihar, we only since last two days, we have some minimal rainfall. Yeah, seen that, that um, the Ganshatic Plains are a little bit drier this year, right? Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. And uh, uh, we are getting from the media that Europe is getting hotter day by day. Yeah, we European... have now we have now the heat bulge, um, the one you experienced a couple of months ago. So uh, we are really sweating and suiting. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes, um, that's what I, I, that's what I... you have mentioned. That uh, the photograph which we have. Uh, included in the thumbnail <laughs> that is from your uh, expedition i think in the himalayas or somewhere else yeah, yeah. I'm sorry i i couldn't find a good picture in oh, it's good. Yeah. Um, but it's it's me actually last year in november standing on the um um prematang it's a big um, landslide event that happened in the melamchi cola up north of Kathmandu last, um, last monsoon. I don't know if you heard oh. about that, that there was a whole... Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. So this is on the, at the source region of all the materials. Mm. Uh, your student, uh, Vijay Puri, was here at our department. He was also talking about uh, that event. So, exactly. Yes, um, mm. uh, yes, yes. Shall I um, try to, since this is the first time on Google um, Talk, for me to, to share you, my slides uh, just to see if it works. Okay, yes. Sure, sure. sure. Um, Yeah, you see, I have to go into to the preferences and allow sharing. Oh. Bhavuk ji, I saw that Christoph, oh no, he's here. He's here. Yeah, yeah, I, I ah, hope yeah, it yeah. works. It works ah, now. Yes. Share. So you all see my screen? Ah, yes. Ah, yeah, Christoph, it's visible. Yes, fine. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. What do you see now? My presenter mode or you see the full screen of my first slide? Ah, uh, full, full screen. Okay. No, present. Ah, yes. That's that's great. So how do I stop sharing? <laughs> no, you stop may uh, keep sending. it like that only. You may keep it like that. If you want, yeah, let's do it. Oh, 
Oh, yes. So, uh, still uh, uh, one, uh, one or two, two minutes left here. And uh, I can see that uh, many of our students of the undergraduate and postgraduate department of geology, they have joined a uh, sizable number, around 40, 40 of them. And I've also requested the faculty members of uh, this department and also few of the uh, science faculty departments here in the Patna University. So mm -hmm. they have been invited to join uh, this uh, very important event for us. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I also look really much forward to uh, Yeah, so uh, as you mentioned uh, yesterday that today you also have uh, one appointment with the doctor. So uh, now it's already too sharp. So uh, let me formally now uh, start the program. Bhavukji and Shekharji, my younger colleagues, uh, they are here. Are you ready, Bhavukji? May I start now? I'm ready. Okay. So, uh, on behalf of uh, the Department of Geology, the faculty members and the staff of the Department of Geology, Patna University, Bihar, India, I'm very happy to, uh, and to share with you all that... Uh, that uh, since last year we have started this uh, Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series because the Department of Geology, Patna University was established in the year 1946 and uh, in the year 2021 we have completed 75 glorious uh, years. So after uh, uh, inauguration of the Platinum Jubilee celebration, we decided to organize a Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series and uh, I'm proudly announcing today that uh, the concluding lecture series is by Dr. Christoph Anderman from Potsdam, Germany. Uh, for uh, uh, Christoph, just to uh, uh, give you information that uh, since last August we have started, I'm just reading out the uh, few of the events which we have conducted uh, during the Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series. In the month of August 2021, Dr. Dipankar Saha, uh, renowned geohydrologist, he talked about the hydrogeology, its rising importance in geoscience. Then in the month of September, Professor Rajiv Sinha from IIT Kanpur, he presented his uh, uh, research work on uh, protocols of basin scale inventory and prioritization of wetlands in Ganga Plains using time series remote sensing data. In the month of October, Mr. Pranjal, Lyle, Pranjay Lal, uh, being a biochemist, public health expert, he dealt exclusively on a, the topic, a deep subconscious control, how tectonics and geology have shaped the fate of all life. Then one of our bright uh, alumina, alumnus, Dr. Nishant, presently working at Delhi, he discussed about GIS beyond maps. That was the topic which we presented to us. Then one of my students and alumnus of this department, presently director of the Geological Survey of India, State Unit Bihar, Mr. Akhauri Vishupriya, he dwelt upon the geology of Bihar in detail for the benefit of the students. Another uh, illustrious uh, alumnus, Mr. Deepak Srivastava, he talked about the climate change and rural development vis-a-vis -vis entrepreneurial opportunities for earth science. Then in the month of February, uh, another uh, uh, alumnus of our department working in the field of coal geology, Sri B. N. Prasad, he talked about the development of coal-based non-conventional energy resources as a step towards clean, uh, clean initiatives. Then it was followed by, in the month of March 2022, Dr. Sudhan Shekhar from Central Groundwater Board, India, and he discussed about mapping of aquifer and groundwater management plan. The next in this series was Dr. Sanjeev Kumar, our student and alumnus of this department. He is presently professor at the Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad. And the topic of his presentation was too much or too little, the story of nitrogen in our environment. It was followed by Vijay Puri. He was here at Patna and I requested him for his presentation. So he dealt upon the event scale interaction among climate, tectonics, hill slope, and fluvial processes in the Himalayas. The, the, uh, the earlier month, that is in the June 2022, we had another uh, scientist, uh, seismologist from uh, USA visiting our state, though from Bihar, 
Dr. Dhananjay Kumar, and he talked about the seismic model response for layered earth. So these are the 11 programs which, was, uh, which were conducted earlier by the Department of Geology under the Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series. And uh, today we are having uh, Dr. Christoph Anderman, who has taken out time of his, uh, from his busy schedule for his presentation on using stable water isotopes to untangle the Himalayan hydrological cycle. Just a brief uh, introduction for the benefit of the students that uh, Professor uh, Dr. Anderman is a geoscientist working at the GFZ, German Research Center for GSR, uh, Geosciences at uh, Potsdam, Germany. And his interest is in the high mountain groundwaters related to transfer of precipitation to river discharge, transient groundwater storage and impact of deep groundwater on surface processes, mountain water reservoirs, river hydrology and flow paths in high mountains. Very interesting topic he has mentioned with the students of undergraduate and postgraduate departments here they talk about is which the uh, uh, Christopher is also having his interest. Christoph, uh, erosion and mass transfer, sediment production, storage and transport, role of water in erosion processes and sediment transport. So you have, uh, Christoph, you have worked exclusively in the Himalayas and other areas related to hydrology and other system associated with the hydrological cycle. So we are very eager to uh, have your presentation and listen to your presentation today under the Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series. So over to you, Christoph, uh, for your presentation. Uh, on behalf of the students and staff, once again, I welcome you to this Platinum Jubilee Lecture Series. Over to you. Yeah, thank you, Artul, for this very nice introduction. I couldn't have done this better. <laughs> um, so yeah, my name is Christoph Andermann, and uh, today I'm going to talk about um, using stable water isotopes to untangle the Himalayan hydrological cycle. You will see this talk will be not only on isotopes; it will be also focusing on the hydrological cycle. And as Artula has already mentioned. A um, big part of this is um, on the role of groundwater in high mountains. Before I'm going to start, um, I would like to uh, introduce you my institute where I'm affiliated to. So this is the Helmholtz Center in Potsdam, the GFZ, the German Research Center for Geosciences. This is the Federal Institute for Geosciences in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. There is about 1,240 or 80 people working there of which are about 1,000 people are scientists, and then there's about 300 guests. Um, and the mission of this institute, so we are part of the big Helmholtz Research Institute family, is um, to understand system Earth from the core to the space, and to deepen the knowledge of solid Earth dynamics, and contribute to the solution for grand societal challenges. And the... Um, Topics we are covering are from geo resources over natural natural disasters risk, risk reduction, but also earth surface processes and climate dynamics. It's the part where I'm sitting in. Then there is continental dynamics, it's tectonics and seismology, and planet Earth monitoring. So we are also um, running our own satellite programs. Um, one of the most famous one you probably heard about is the Grace mission that is developed and um, um, run from the GFZ. So let me talk, let me start with an introduction to my talk. I talk about world water towers. You all might, might have known about this, um, about this term. And it has been coined largely in the Himalayas, but also in other mountain ranges. And mountains are called water towers because they provide a disproportional high runoff compared to lowlands. You can see this here in the warm colors. These are high runoff per area, and the more um, light colors are less runoff. And you can see nicely how the Himalayas are traced by these warm colors. And this is important, um, especially because 1.5 billion people or one third of world irrigation area depends heavily on this runoff. And this is mainly because mountains are very effective. They're sticking out into the atmosphere and they're really good in harvesting water from the atmosphere, much better than lowlands. And the storage capacity in these mountains, this is the important part, especially in the Himalayas, because you have this really wet season and a very dry season. 
Um, so you have to store enough water to get through the dry season for a very long time. And this storage capacity is not so well known. And this is mainly because of groundwater. And even the International um, Panel of Climate Change has identified mountain groundwater as the big unknown. Let me go a little bit back to one of the key papers that came out of my PhD. I was doing in Rennes in France. Here I showed that there is a evidence for a large groundwater reservoir. It's a complicated figure. It's um, a gauging station at the Nariani um, outlet. So this is basically before it becomes the Gandaki River that joins the Ganges River at Patna. And you see there 55 years of precipitation on the x-axis plotted against discharge on the y-axis. And first of all, this looks like a complicated um, point cloud. But if you color this point cloud by, um, by time in the year, there is a pattern that emerges. And it's an hysteresis effect. So basically, at the beginning of the year, so in the blue colors, you have um, little discharge for some rain. Um, and um, at the same time, or at the same precipitation range at the end of monsoon season, there is much more discharge than there is at the beginning. And this means that the water is kind of recharged during the early time, during monsoon, and then is purged over the long lasting dry seasons until it comes down again. And I have calculated this with models and I've shown that two thirds of the annual river discharge go through a deep ground water. And this is mainly in the fractured and crystalline rocks. So it's deep ground water. You can see this on this nice picture up there, which is taken from somewhere in the middle, Kaligandaki, um, where the water is pouring out from this fracture. <laughs> It's relatively complicated if you look at this at the first glance. So there's a lot of processes going on there, but it all falls back to the water um, balance equation. So there's precipitation in form of snow and rain that comes into the system. There's uh, discharge. Uh, sorry to disturb you and interrupt you. Slides, uh, uh, we can uh, see only the uh, first slide only. The slides are not moving. Okay. Oh, yes. You see it now, five, slide five. Do I have to end my show and start again? Ah, uh, yeah. This, uh, you see this, slide five now? Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Uh, so, uh, yes. The high mountain uh, water cycle slide. The, yeah, uh, this exactly. Slide five. Slide five. Yeah, this is slide five, and this is the, basically it summarizes the water balance equation of the high mountains. And there's the, the rain and snow going in, as I mentioned already. There's discharge in rivers going out. Um, there's also water leaving the landscape through evaporation and transpiration. And there is a term that's called delta S, it's the storage variability, and that's the most complicated one in this equation. And storage uh, variability is, um, is a composite of glacier storage, but also snow storage, groundwater storage, the hyperhoric storage within the, close to the rivers, and soil water storage. And a method I'm using um, is stable water isotopes. So this is the framework, how, how it works. And you all know water is made out of hydrogen and oxygen, and both elements have isotopes. So there is um, um, oxygen is mainly O18, but there's also uh, mainly O16, but there's also some O18 in there. And um, the ratio of how much um, between those two is depending on where the water is coming from and also how the water has been supplied. So if you come from the equator, this is normal, normalized to zero per mil um, water slowly gets depleted. So it gets a negative term um, as it comes to the mountains. And if you're in the high mountains, they are very negative, indicated here with minus 10. And the same applies for hydrogen. Uh, for, yeah, for hydrogen. Um, and if you compare the systems, normally they um, evolve linearly. So they plot on a line that's called the meteorite water line. But the diversions from this line give us information on 
where the water, what the water has experienced on the way in the clouds until precipitation. For example, um, samples plotting below this line usually have experienced evapor evaporation. So all what you have to know is um, high isotope ratios are enriched, positive notion, and they come from the, the indicate oceanic evaporation and the continental precipitation is usually depleted and has a negative notion. So from there, I go, um, I go and I show you what I'm going to tell today. So I'm going to talk you today through this landscape I've shown you. So I'm going to start from trees, how they record precipitation, then how precipitation is coming into the rivers. And in the third chapter, I show you how the surface is connected with the subsurface. And then I'm going to talk how the groundwater um, is then coming out again into the rivers and contributes to river discharge. And finally, I talk a little bit about the Hello Monsoon project, um, just with a few wrap up slides to show you what we are going to do and where Patna University is also part of, of the team um, doing rainwater sampling on the, on the roof for stable water isotope analysis. So, my research area is the Kaligandaki. You see Patna is sitting down here and I'm looking along this river because it's a very nice river. It spans a perfect transect from the north to the south across all the Himalayan ranges and uh, uh, lithologies and also captures the whole um, precipitation um, gradient. Um, so, I don't know if you can see this video now. I probably have to leave my my laser pointer so this is probably a familiar picture but in the video it's very nice you can see how precipitation is going in into the system and it's going out into the system that's interesting um, and it's really important for my studies because this is the reason why i'm working in the himalayas because we have this concentrated precipitation period and a very long dry period. So it's very relatively easy from that perspective to distangle the ingoing and the outgoing fluxes in the hydrosystem. I'm just going to show you this again. So you see during winter, it's all it's dry. Brown colors are no rain and blue colors are a lot of rain. And then slowly from the Bay of Bengal, precipitation is encroaching into the continent. And then there is a lot of precipitation during monsoon and it's going all the way west and then slow. So along, along this river, I have um, installed two gauging stations since 2013 and they're measuring on a daily resolution until today. There is one in the upper part, it's later indicated with the one and the lower one, um, Puttigat. So later integrates everything of the catchment that is coming in from north from the, um, from the dry part of the catchment. And Puttigat integrates the upper part, but also the wet south facing front. And at these two stations, we do discharge and um, weather monitoring. We also have employed people who do daily sampling for us. And on the samples, we do stable water isotopes, major element geochemistry, suspended sediment analysis also. And we additionally have some other sensors like seismic monitoring and rainwater sampling. So this brings me now to my first topics. Trees record precipitation. It's a project together with the University of Bozen in South Tyrol in Italy. And it was done by a PhD student, um, Camilla Brunello, and it's published in EPSL 2019. And it basically what we wanna what we want to do here is how trees record precipitation and what we can learn from this. Um, for the, the past monsoon and precipitation variability in the landscape. So you can go and drill a tree and walk along annual tree rings. So each of this ring of this um, stripe is a tree ring and it has been formed in, in a particular year and we can understand which ring corresponds to which year by simply counting from the outside to the inside. And we can take cellulose samples at each of this ring 
and analyze the cellulose for the isotopic composition and then from the isotopic composition learn something about climate. And this is how it looks like. These are three stations or three locations along um, the transect. The southern ones is in Lete. I showed you the, the, where the sta gauging station is. Then we have one further up in the almost tripod in Sama and one very high in Chuchumuya. Um, it's almost on the border with um, China. So at the drainage divide between the Tsangpo River and the Kaligandaki or Ganshi, um, uh, uh, um, how do you call it, the Kanali, uh, Gandaki River, or what is flowing into the Ganges. And these are the three time series um, derived from there. Um, we see time on the x-axis and the cellulose O18 composition on the y-axis. So um, this is the composite of these three positions and what we see, that's what I show you already in the um, isotopic framework. If you go, if you're in the north, the water is more, um, um, sorry, it's the other way around. If you're in the north, the water is more, um, uh, is less enriched and uh, is, is, is less depleted and the other way around. And this is the center location that sits in between. And we see also that there is a lot of variability over this time frame. And now we're going to look only at the later um, um, time series to understand a little bit better what's going on there. And this is how it's done. You see here Camilla Brunello taking a tree core and we also locked um, the radial growth of the tree with a dendrometer. And this is up there in the picture is how the location looks like. So we sampled pine forest trees. And within this time series, there is about 15 samples integrated. Um, always five, also five trees with each, um, not sorry, not 15, but 10, um, with two cores. And the gray lines behind show the individual trees. And um, um, the, the, the orange line shows the mean chronology. And then there is a moving average over um, some years. And what is very interesting to see is that it goes down and then in the um, 70s, it starts to change the trend and it goes up again. And this is something that interested us also. So this is the climatology at the location. It's again, a complicated figure. It's the time series over three years, 2016 to 2017. You have on the left hand y axis the radial growth. This is plotted in a cumulative way. So you see very nice the tree starts growing in March and then it stops growing in September. Um, and this corresponds roughly to the availability of precipitation. And then there is a platform. And again, in March, the tree starts growing again and then uh, kind of platforms again in this in September period. On top of this, you see temperature, how it goes up and down. You see also the precipitation plotting here, this parameters plot here on the right hand side of the um, of the um, of the plot, and you see also the rain um, delta O18 we have measured at certain locations, and what is here really stunning is that you have a trend from very rich, uh, very uh, less enriched, so from almost positive values, or in 2017 there were even more than positive to very negative values in monsoon. Um, this is interesting because usually people interpret um, stable water isotopes as a monsoon signal, but actually what we see here is that the most of the signal is allocated to the pre-monsoon and not to the monsoon season. So to understand a little bit better what the tree actually records, if it's the monsoon or if it's the pre-monsoon, we plugged all these parameters into a plant physiological model um, published by Karman to model from the, um, from the climatology the tree ring isotopic signatures and um, to reproduce the time series. And what we found out, so this is the result of the model and the green line is the um, actually measured one. And what we found out that we cannot do that if you only consider the monsoon precipitation, we don't understand the tree rings. But we do understand the tree rings if we consider a pre-monsoon season with a very enriched 
almost positive or positive isotopic rainfall signature. So there is an enriched um, pre-monsoon and a depleted monsoon that is um, composed within the tree ring, and we have to untangle them to understand what's going on, actually. So uh, to sorry, come back... Sorry to interrupt yeah. one second. Uh, Christoph, still uh, these lights are uh, stuck at place and uh, it's not moving. So what is the... Uh, the, what slide, is the... Only slide number five is visible in my screen and uh, the colleagues also. Five only. Oh, so yeah. you haven't seen anything of my talk. <laughs> um, so, uh, it's getting, uh, it's changing now. Yes, now it's uh, thirteen. It's like thirteen. Hmm. How 13. do we, how do we do that better? So this is thirteen. You are seeing thirteen now. Uh, ah, yeah. uh, yes. Now it's thirteen. Thirteen. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I suggest I do this differently. So I, um, I, I don't go in presenter mode. I show you the slides in this way. It might be a little bit awkward because they're not so big. But then I can follow on the, on the browser where I am and if you can see the slides. Okay? Okay. Okay. So still to wrap up, um, what we've seen from the stable water isotopes in tree rings is that there is a seasonality in the stable water isotopes that different precipitation regimes supply different isotopic signatures. And we have to take them into account to understand actually a paleo record like a tree ring. But this could be also important to understand ice cores or stalagmites and so forth. So the, the essential key message is actually to say that um, what is what is recorded in in archives is not only a monsoon signal it's a composite of the pre-monsoon and the monsoon and from there i go to the um, tracing precipitation into rivers it's another study i've done together with hima hasen reguti party and it's in revisions at hu advances right now and we have measured in the river and in the landscape um, more than 1,800 stable water isotope measurements covering all types of waters, rain, uh, river water, rainwater, um, spring water, snow water, glacier water, and so forth. And this is to understand now how these different types of waters end up in the river and if we can, if we can see something about that. So what can we learn from, from a long-term and detailed time series of river water isotopes into the landscape? have again the upper part in later catchment and the Portigat, which is the southern station. Um, you see here at the upper right precipitation derived from GPM satellite precipitation measurements into the monsoon period. And now it gets interesting if you look at the lower panel. This is the, um, in, this in this case, not the O18, not the oxygen isotope composition, but the hydrogen composition, which I mentioned is um, Evolving linear. Hello, good morning, sir. And um, so you have um, good morning of wickerly lines, and there is again what I mentioned before. Even in the river discharge, we see at the pre-monsoon season a positive, so an upward signature, which then gets negative during the monsoon season. And the same is shown with these diamonds in the precipitation. This is basically the same data I have shown before with the tree rings. And so um, we see a seasonality, again, that is um, reflected by the pre-monsoon. And what I should mention also is that after, in the trial period, the, stable, the signature is very stable and it's all, it's, it represents the monsoon signature. So what we think from here is that there is a different input, again, and during the rest of the year it's rather stable. And that means that the the dry period is drained through a large reservoir, which we think is a groundwater that is recharged during monsoon and then slowly depletes um, during the dry period. We can also plot this in, a, in the map framework. It's basically what I've shown you in the beginning. Um, you have O18 on the x-axis and hydrogen 
um, deuterium on the y-axis, and this plots all the values, and they really nicely line up along the meteoric waterline. So from the first glance, all the water in the river and in the um, rain and in the snow and glaciers has not experienced any evaporation. Or evaporation in the active part doesn't play any, in the active hydrology doesn't play any role. What we see is that the surface water sampled at the Gangetic Plains, this is data from literature, they tail off from the plot lower, so this means there is evaporation going on there. And what we also see is um, in the, why the pre-monsoon is so positive and monsoon is so negative. We applied um, high split modeling. This is a, um, a back trajectory model that actually helps us to go back in time so we can put at a certain location in the landscape, this is here, and see where the moisture has come from. And these are wiggly lines. They are all integrating one week, so 164 hours and they're color coded according to the season and we see nicely in the reddish lines the westerlies and then uh, in a, to a different map view um, separating between pre-monsoon and monsoon season we see that most of the moisture in pre-monsoon is sourced very close mainly from the Gangetic plain while during monsoon the moisture is sourced from far field in the um, offshore some of it is also recycled very close to it and um, so uh, I asked the question, what can we learn from this long-term and detailed time series of river water isotopes? And we think that this difference between pre-monsoon and monsoon is because of heavy evaporation in the Gangetic Plain. And this precipitation and that the, the pre-monsoon is actually sourced in the Gangetic Plains due to um, surface irrigation and so on. It's a very wet place. And this has changed the isotopic signature due to evaporation, and then it's carried as a rain into the into the um, into the Himalayan range. While the um, monsoon, as the dominant input of waters, is sourced offshore and brings in a different isotopic signature. And you can see this on this map. Um, it's an irrigation map, uh, um, uh, irrigated. Land uh, uh, surface area map by Thunberg in 2012, where you see there is a lot of irrigation taking place in the Indian foreland. And um, yeah, so um, moisture source and transport processes determine distinct pre monsoon and monsoon isotopic signatures. And the water recycling in the Gangetic Plains sets the isotope composition of pre monsoon rainfall in the Himalayas. So from there, I want to investigate a little bit how the water is infiltrating from the surface into the subsurface. And for this, we use um, seismometers. You may be a little bit astonished now. It's a study together with Luc Ilian, a PhD student here at the GFZ. And we use a very specific um, method. We use passive seismic interferometry. So, you all know that um, earthquakes do a seismic signal or big explosions, but also people walking in the landscape or river flowing or a rock fall, a landslide. Everything that happens on the surface is generating vibrations, seismic um, signals that travel through the landscape and can be recorded by seismometers. Usually this kind of um, waves are um, uh, would, uh, considered as noise and they are filtered out by seismologists who want to understand earthquakes. But we make use of this noise and we only look at the, at, the, at the noise scale. And for this, to understand the subsurface hydrology, it's, um, it's very interesting to look at at which speed these waves travel. And the um, subsurface conditions kind of determine how fast seismic waves can travel. So if you have, for example, a saturated subsurface, the waves are traveling um, slower. And if you have an unsaturated um, subsurface, the waves are traveling faster. Um, so you all can see this. I take you to a little catchment where we manage, where we monitor this. It's in this panel, we see again, three years of data. 
its uh, precipitation plotting in blue on the left-hand y-axis and water level uh, locked at the outlet of this catchment. This is uh, called the Kahule Kola catchment north of Kathmandu is plotted in black on the right-hand y-axis. And again, we have the, the wet, the monsoon season, and we have the gray, it's the pre-monsoon season. And, oops, um, now I have to go on presentation mode because this is animated. Let's, let's try if it works. Can you see that? Oops, sorry. Can you see? Can you see the center, the second panel now? So these are the seismic velocities in black um, at two different locations. And as I mentioned, in the dry season, they are faster and they kind of back, uh, run ping up. And then when the wet season come, uh, starts, they're falling down. So this shows that there is a groundwater variability of, um, uh, of high groundwater corresponding to low seismic velocities and low groundwater values corresponding to high seismic velocities. And this is counter mimicked by soil moisture we measured at the seismic locations. So at the, at the pre-monsoon season, soil moisture builds up slowly and then when it, um, then it kind of platforms and then it slowly um, 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 depletes again over the, the dry season until the next wet sea or pre-monsoon season starts. And that's actually interesting because you can see that exactly when it platforms, um, the seismic velocity drops. That means groundwater is recharging. And at the same time also, if you look in the upper panel, the river discharge is picking up. So if you walk on now through this season, then you have low velocity, so high groundwater, a lot of river discharge, high soil moisture, until the rain stops, soil moisture drops down, the seismic velocities accelerate, meaning the groundwater is going down and the river level um, resides slowly over the entire period. And even, sorry, and even in the next season, while it starts already raining, the river doesn't pick up on this and the groundwater doesn't see it, but soil moisture is slowly um, starting to bulk up. And that shows us that actually the soil is kind of a gatekeeper that um, controls how groundwater is, um, is, is recharged and when river discharge is taking place. And we can also see that again, um, it's counter mimicked by the, by the isotopes. So they're plotting here in red. You have this negative, a positive values during pre-monsoon. During monsoon, they fall down, then they're stable over the whole year. Then they go up in pre-monsoon again, then they fall down in monsoon and so forth. And the same, uh, we see also that um, in the black dots, this is the vegetation cover, how it builds up. It's better seen here in 2017. So it's building up during pre-monsoon, then it stays high during monsoon and it falls down again um, during the dry season. And um, let's go to the next. So we developed the model from that that kind of explains what's going on. We have the dry season, ground water is low, the surface soil and redose zone is dry, and the trees are not green, there's little transpiration evaporation going on, the discharge is very low. Then we start moving into um, pre-monsoon season. This is when Precipitation picks up, the trees are starting to green. There's a lot of transpiration, evaporation going into the atmosphere and the soil moisture and the red zone is slowly um, getting wetter. Then during monsoon, when the monsoon starts, the groundwater, uh, the surface water can infiltrate into the groundwater. The groundwater table goes up, meaning the seismic velocities here on the slow, lower part drop. And we are uh, sorry, uh, we are viewing slide number 23, Christoph. Still. Earlier it was moving, but now it's only 23. Uh, yes. Can you see now 24? Yes, now it's visible. Okay. So I was here at this plot where, 20, uh, where, where, where monsoon is connected. 
and then during monsoon it's covered and then in the end of the season groundwater is going down again the trees uh, have no leaves and so forth and so this can explain this model can explain how the um, the water is infiltrating to the subsurface and is and the groundwater is reacting to the rain so um uh, dry season and groundwater depletes progressively pre-monsoon surface moisture builds up and then plants grow groundwater still depletes at this period and then during monsoon surface reaches field capacity so it's all saturated and it breaks through to the groundwater and river discharge picks up and then you have the monsoon season when it's over there is a rapid um, um, there is rapid discharge supported by high water table and then slowly the trees um, um, the trees have still access to the groundwater and then in the dry season there is a um, loss of access to the groundwater by the trees and also the, the the river discharge is kind of reciting back so i go out of my presentator mode to come back to to show you this exactly so to conclude on this um little project um how it's how surface water is connected with the subsurface it's the shallow soil moisture saturate Saturation controls the river discharge in steep mountains. That's very important. Um, also for future scenarios, for example, when rain frequency distribution changes, maybe. And the delivery of fresh water from mountains depends on the subsurface conditions. Um, and to underline or underscore a little bit more that there is a large groundwater reservoir, I show you this slide. It's unpublished data until now. It's a river gauge in the Botekoshi River, um, and it, it shows a time series from April to June in 2015, covering the Goka earthquake. You remember there was a very strong earthquake in April 2015, and what we see is in the stage height there is a sudden jump. So when I saw this data, I thought, oh, the, the gauge must have been broken. Um, something now it's the, the river water a river level has changed or so but if you go in higher resolution just looking at the week um, covering the earthquake we see that the increase is gradual and it's over 24 hours so this is actually a real change and we think that the earthquake has changed the hydrological conductivity in the mountains so the groundwater is draining faster and therefore the river discharge has increased and this is very interesting because you can see here at this hydrograph the earthquake happened at the end of the dry season so the entire system hasn't seen any precipitation input for about uh, seven to uh, six to seven months um, and still we can unlock a lot of groundwater and by just a little back of the envelope calculation the river water has increased during due to the earthquake by 50 percent and yeah, this kind of supports that there's a lot of groundwater in mountains. Um, and then the next chapter is about how groundwater contributes to the river again. This is a project I have started um, some years ago. And here we look at radon 222. Radon 222 is a radioactive um, gas that is produced in the uranium decay series within the rocks and it's very volatile um, so water that is percolating through the rocks in the saturated um, zone is dissolved uh, the radon is dissolving into this and as soon as the river water or the water gets to the surface the radon degasses into the atmosphere and is lost in the in the river water um, and also very interesting is that this radon gas, um, uh, radon has a half-life of only four days. So we have, um, we are losing it also by, by radioactive decay. And this, this, this can be made as a tracer to understand actually where groundwater is contributing to river water. Because if we can measure radon in the river, we can as we can um, we, we know that uh, that there is groundwater contribution to the river itself otherwise um, the radon would have been lost and we can't measure it anymore um, 
So next slide. So we conducted an experiment to understand this. We walked down the entire river um, from Chomson in the upper part of the catchment all the way down to the outlet of the of the river or to the border with India. It's, we covered about 360 kilometer lengths of this river and we sampled the river, the main river at 10 kilometer intervals. And we sampled also all the tributaries and the springs we could find on this pathway. Um, the Kaligandaki is very interesting to do that because it um, has high salt input on the upstream that is coming from evaporite um, deposits and they contribute high chloride concentrations to the river and this is diluted then through the, through the entire Himalayan um, transect to a lower value. And you can see that the river is always higher than the contribution by, by the main river, uh, by springs or tributaries. And from this information, we could actually calculate a river discharge by uh, conducting a simple salt tracer experiment across the entire Himalayan range. So the dilution informs us how much, comf uh, how much river water is there. And with this, we can then um, model the, the, the river discharge. And this is the radon information I just mentioned. So this is on the y-axis is the radon in becquerel per cubic meter of water. So this is a measured as an activity, not as a concentration, but it can be seen as a as a as an analog to concentration, and on the y and the x axis is the distance along the river. Um, zero is the border with India, and um, three hundred fifty is somewhere north of the Himalayan range. And you also see the river profile plotting here on the right hand axis. Um, looking at this data, it's a it's a big scatter. But there is a distinct difference between spring water and river and tributary water. Um, and what we also see, all the values are well below, uh, above the atmospheric concentration. So the river is always higher concentration than the atmosphere. That means and along the entire river lengths, there is groundwater seeping into the river, um, leading to higher radon concentrations in the river that actually can be measured. And they are sitting somewhere between the input of by the springs and the atmospheric concentration. And we plugged this into a degassing model and um, used our calculated river discharge from the salt tracer experiment to understand actually how much radon has been produced or if the radon we measure here, for example, has been carried in from an upstream location. And by doing this, we come to this plot here on the right hand side. Again, distance on the x axis. And there's on the y axis is the, ra um, the radon gained along the river transect. And so for most of the sampling points, the radon gained within the 10 kil kilometer increments is um, between 80 and 100%. So it really means there is a diffusive groundwater contribution to the river. And um, this is very interesting and important because you see the experiment has been done during dry season in March and um, that it's not as many people um, say that the glaciers um, furnish the, the base flow during dry season. It's also the groundwater that's important and we have now in the future to understand what is the separation, how much glacier actually contributes to the river discharge and what is the role of groundwater in comparison to that and what happens when, for example, glaciers melt and, um, and only groundwater is, is there to support the river discharge. But um, from these calculations, we, we see that um, only 5% to 10% is glacier melt and all the rest is actually groundwater. So this kind of underlines how important um, groundwater is, and there's groundwater contributing everywhere along this, across the Himalayas to the river discharge. So to wrap up this kind of um, topics, the main conclusions coming back to the water balance equation. So we I showed that there's two precipitation seasons with distinct isotopic signatures, and the seasonality is transmitted <coughs> through the storage in the subsurface and anywhere on the surface to the river and 
the, um, and also the seasonality is recorded in climate archives. Um, river discharge is largely fed by diffusive groundwater drainage and evapotranspiration in the foreland drives pre-monsoon rain. So this is an interesting notion um, and this is actually the, the motivation for this uh, rainwater sampling experiment we're doing together with the University of Patna um, is to understand um, how the evaporation in the foreland is contributing precipitation to the Himalayas and um, how human has actually changed this due to uh, irrigating large surface areas in the Gangetic forelands. And then there is the Delta S shallow subsurface controls the groundwater recharge and river discharge and groundwater is an important water storage buffer in mountains. And from there I'm going to move a little bit further to show you an outlook and to explain you um, the rainwater sampling we are doing, so the Hello Monsoon project together with the University of Patna. And this is because we have developed this very nice device that is shown here. It's an automatic rainwater sampler that can take 165 discrete samples with a resolution <coughs> of two millimeters of rainfall or five minutes in time. This is very a lot and it's too much to understand actually monsoon because months, there's so much monsoon um, rain taking care we would fill up this device within no time. So uh, for this experiment, we have increased it to five millimeters. And um, yeah, this device is remote accessible via GSM mobile connection, and it operates very autonomous and um, can be remote service. So we can see how many samples have been filled when people have to go there to change the, 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 the samples and, and empty it. And very important for isotopic sampling, the samples are sealed. This is kind of a unique um, point compared to other automatic sampling devices which don't uh, seal the samples. So there is always evaporation going on in the samples and we don't know actually anymore what's going on after, um, after we have collected the samples. If this is an evaporation signal due to not sealed samples or if this is a real um, precipitation signal. And just to show you a little um, example for um, how of the performance of this device. This is a, a very heavy rainfall event in Potsdam. For Potsdam, this is very heavy. For you and guys in Patna, this might be not so um, heavy. But it's about <clears throat> um, um, 50 to 80 millimeters of rainfall in 24 hours. And you can see on the y-axis the deuterium, so the hydrogen isotope um, signature and down the x-axis and here uh, plotted precipitation. And we see a very distinct signal through this rain event, through this 24 hours. So the, the, the black dots are the isotopic signatures. <coughs> and it actually shows a varia variation of more than 60 per mil. And this is much more what we would see throughout the entire year if we only take uh, samples by the hand um, for every week or so. And so the, it shows how, what the potential is in there to do this high resolution sampling to understand something about um, uh, supply processes and where the water is actually coming from. And for this, we developed, um, uh, we built in, large, uh, in last May um, this, this, this sampling transect. The yellow um, pins on this map are the automatic samplers. So we put six out of them in a transect starting from Indian border, the next one is on 1,200 meters in Tansen, then we are already at 2,000 meters um, at a place called Bakunde, and then we go up to 3,600 at a place called Cobra, and then we are already behind the, uh, the, 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 the Himalayan range at Lete, 2,500 meters, and Marfa about 3,000 meters. And we extended this with manual sampling upstream at some locations, and also with manual sampling <coughs> at the University of Patna. Thanks, thank you, Artur, for, for coordinating this. And we also have um, Intrase from um, Kanpur campus, who is also doing some sampling for us. And this is how it looks like the station. So this is at the, in the south, and Bellatari, and then Tansen, and we go up to Bakunda, 
already see some glimpse of the Himalayan range. This is the highest place. It's in the clouds already. And then going to later behind and Marfa and um, maybe north. And just to complete it, <clears throat> the rain gauge sitting on your rooftop. And with that picture, I'd like to thank you for your attention and um, acknowledge all the co-authors that have contributed to my research. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Christoph, for a wonderful and very interesting interesting presentation and very intricately you have uh, uh, presented how the uh, the glaciers the, uh, the river discharge and the the vegetation how they are all intricately uh, connected the students particularly must be knowing uh, these things but uh, the experimental presentation before them is something very encouraging for uh, the students of the University of Patna. I have a small query and uh, I'd like to ask you that here in this part of the globe where you are having sampling also, over the uh, last uh, uh, decade, we are uh, talking about the climate change. And in this aspect, in the state of Bihar, gradually the water table is going down and down and down. So the contribution of the water, uh, the groundwater to the river system uh, is, uh, is, is something which is uh, alarming for the state of Bihar. As in our state, during the flood season, that is from uh, July to uh, August and September, we get heavy rain in Nepal. And in no less time, the area north of uh, the, uh, the Patna, the northern part of the Bihar is inundated. But very soon, the, uh, that flood part is over. But in those areas also, the water, the water table is uh, going. The city of Dabanga and many other important parts where they are where the uh, population is there, urbanization is growing. So uh, how? what is your view? What do you view that uh, with respect to time when uh, the groundwater uh, is going down and down, what would be the contribution of the groundwater in the northern half of uh, the state of Bihar? How it will be uh, interacting, interacting with the river discharge and river system? Um, yeah, thank you for this very nice question. I mean, there's, um, th this is, there's two systems, right? There's the groundwater system in the mountains, and there's the groundwater system in the um, foreland of the Himalayas, which is a sedimentary basin, um, very thick um, packs of sediments, um, and heavy, heavy agricultural um, use of this of this land surface. And as you all know, the rivers, as soon as they come out from the from the Himalayas, there quickly captured and <clears throat> um, diverted in irrigation channels on the surface. So, um, but this is not the only source for irrigation. It's also groundwater, as you all know. And this is something that this um, use of groundwater um, for, for, for supporting crop, uh, crop grow and, and, and cash fruits is, um, is, is in a way important because it supplies us with food. But on the other way, it's kind of um, it's, it's 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 higher than what the, what the infiltration can supply to to stabilize the groundwater table, and this has been measured with, with many with many methods. You can see that uh, looking at boreholes, but also with the Grace satellite I've mentioned before, which is um, measuring the gravity field on the of the entire Earth. It can see that there is a gravity field change in the Gangetic foreland. Um, and that, the, that there is actually a drop, um, there's a loss of mass in this area that is due to the um, groundwater depletion. What is, I think, important or the good news um, is that groundwater in mountains is important and it can buffer the, the hydrological system of the mountains. So the supply seems to be, um, the supply seems to be um, supported by groundwater, and even if glaciers are shrinking rapidly and might disappear in some unforeseeable future, they, um, the groundwater might have the potential to, to support still um, groundwater flow or uh, river flow during, during dry periods. Um, this, I mean, this is, this is something we really have to look into into the future, how we how we manage 
water resources more responsible at the yeah. one hand but on the other hand also um um find a sustainable way to sustain our food supply right i mean this this irrigation fields they probably are one of the the richest places for whole india to supply rice and, and other cash foods so there's right, a, right. a trade-off to to do somehow hmm. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Christoph. Uh, we may have uh, one or two more questions from the students or other participants uh, of this lecture series presentation. Anybody, research scholars, faculty members, and other participants, if you have any query, uh, Christoph is uh, there to your queries. Anyone? I don't. I don't bite. I'm far away. <laughs> ah, am I audible, Christoph? Hello. Hello. Am I audible? Ah, uh, uh, yes, Vikas. Yes. Uh, actually, I was willing to ask. Uh, in one slide, you have mentioned intense irrigation in Indo-Gangetic plain leads to higher evaporation. Yes. If we see the water table in Indo-Gangetic plain and other subsurface water condition that is very near, that is more conducive for agriculture and other allied purposes. So whether it's not skeptical or questionable that intense irrigation is the process that is more prominent in Indo-Gangetic plain. I mean, it's a little bit out of my core expertise, I would say. Um, the, the the main, I think the main um, irrigation water is coming from surface water, from rivers coming out of the high Himalayas. But, um, and in a way, they can be also used to, to artificially recharge groundwater, right? I mean, you can create spaces where um, the water is maybe not so exposed to evaporation and transpiration, but could be infiltrated in uh, um, a healthy groundwater table. But this is, this is geoengineering um, and has to be explored further in the future, I think. And this is something probably that will be, will be coming um, very pressing in the near future already. As we, as we all rely on water as a, as a resource and we have to sustain it and yeah, kind of mitigate it as a, as a, as a resource and cannot, cannot afford to, to kind of um, exploit it the way we're doing at the moment. Does, does this okay. answer your question? Uh, yeah, okay. we, may, we may have uh, one uh, last question, if it is there, uh, and then uh, I may ask uh, my younger colleague, uh, Shekhar, to formally propose a vote of thanks. One last mm -hmm. question, if any of the parts, if you wish to ask to the presentation which we had just now by Christoph. So uh, as there is no query, Christoph, right now, so uh, thanks again, once again, uh, from uh, the Department of Geology. And I formally invite uh, Mr. Shekhar, younger colleague at the Department of Geology, to uh, formally propose a vote of thanks. Mr. Shekhar. Namaskar, sir. Sir, am I audible? Yes, uh, yes you are audible, Shekhar. Thank you, sir. Uh, before before going to the uh, formal vote of thanks, uh, I would like to uh, congratulate sir, uh, head of the department, Patna University, for uh, successfully coordinating the entire Platinum Jubilee lecture series. Sir, uh, we have witnessed the quality talks throughout this lecture series, and now as it goes international with the inclusion of. Uh, German counterpart, Dr. Christoph Anderson, Anderman, sorry. Uh, so sir, first of all, I'd like to congratulate you for your brilliant and hardworking uh, 
choice for arranging this lecture series in this tough uh, COVID scenario. So uh, now coming to the uh, vote of thanks. Uh, today's uh, invited uh, speaker, uh, Dr. Christoph Anderman, GFZ, German Research Center for uh, Geosciences, Potsdam, Germany. Sir, I am really uh, like to congratulate you for this uh, wonderful lecture. As the uh, picking of this isotopic ratios to uh, elaborate and uh, discuss the hydrological cycle in the Himalayan region, as uh, there are uh, several components from its uh, recharge to discharge and uh, several aspects of contamination. But sir, you have brilliantly delivered today's lecture in this uh, uh, short uh, duration. And also, sir, it uh, will really help us in understanding the origin pathways, the chemical evolution during the hydrological cycle. So really thankful, sir, for to the Christoph Anderman for delivering today's lecture. I'd also like to thank the faculty members, the staff of this department, and the technical team for uh, organizing this lecture series and their tireless hard work. Also to the distinguished guests who have joined this and the alumni of this department, our students, research scholars for their participation and their patience during the entire lecture series. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for today's lecture. Uh, thank yeah. you, Shay. And uh, before we close the session, uh, just a token of appreciation. This is a small uh, memento which we have uh, developed for the Platinum uh, Jubilee. This is uh, for the, the, uh, Christoph. When, whenever you will be visiting Patna next time, and I request you to visit our department, and this will be reserved for you. So with this, uh, we conclude the Platinum Jubilee lecture series with a request that uh, in the month of uh, November or December, we are planning a, uh, a big program to celebrate the Platinum Jubilee. So we'll release a souvenir uh, of uh, the lecture series, which we have organized. And on behalf of the, of the Department of Geology, I'll request you to just share a few pages so that we can incorporate and include your wonderful presentation in our souvenir, which will be released sometimes in November or December. So with this, uh, once again, uh, thank you from the Department of Geology, from the entire faculty members. Thank you, Shekharji, and all of the members. So with this, yeah. we conclude. Thank you very much for giving me the chance to talk in this wonderful um, um, talk series you just mentioned. It's an honor for me also, and I'm, I'm very happy looking forward to, to work together and make this first collaborative work on the um, rainfall, rainwater sampling a uh, so successful base for, for further collaborations also. Thank you very much and I'm, I'm very happy to contribute to, to the little series, like to write a few pages on, on, on my view on the hydrological cycle. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I stopped presenting, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you very much. See you all soon, hopefully. Bye bye. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Christoph, for a nice presentation. Thank you, sir.